we once again praise you and worship you for the wonderful presence of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, the way that your Holy Spirit has been so present with us during the whole of this course, Father. And we worship you because of the anointing, Father, that you give to us. Father, you do the impossible. You really are a wonderful, wonderful God. And thank you, Father, you've given us a wonderful salvation that we can just enter into and joy in and rejoice over. Oh, I just praise you. Your glory, your wonder are beyond our words. Oh, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you may be glorified. Father, I want to pray that every tape that's sent out of this series may have with it the anointing. Father, unless the anointing of your Holy Spirit is there, then there's no point, Father, we know that. And I pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit might be on every tape that's sent out. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Alright, now we come to the 14th and the last in the present series. We talked about judgments all this time. Now let's just go through some of the judgments that we've actually seen during the course. First of all, we've seen the judgment of Satan. And I described that as the three falls of Satan. Then we saw the judgment by God and by man of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we saw the judgment of sin in the life of the believer. Then we saw uh, the judgment of self in the believer, which is something, of course, that every be believer must do every day. And the phrase, of course, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 31, where it says, If we judge ourselves, we be not judged. That is the daily judgment of the believer. We then saw the judgment of the believer's works. And that was an important one. Then the five cycles of discipline to Israel, or the judgment of the nation of Israel. Then the judgment of nations, or the horns and the carpenters, if you remember. Then we saw the judgment of Israel at the second advent, which we called the baptism of fire. Then last time we saw the parable about the baptism of fire, which actually uh, set it off. You remember it was laid alongside the baptism of fire, and it made perfect sense as soon as you got it. Praise God. Tonight, we come to the last, and perhaps the most devastating, of all the judgments. The final <coughs> one that will affect this present earth and this present universe. And it's called the Great White Throne. The judgment of the Great White Throne. Remember, it's white, and as soon as we read white in the scriptures, we're talking about purity. We're talking about absolute righteousness. And this throne, which is great because it's got a great judge sitting on it in power and glory, represents the righteousness of God. I pray that as I speak about this tonight, the reality may grip every person that's listening. This is the most important subject for us all to understand. We need every day the reality of the great white throne that's coming in the future. You, my Christian brothers and sisters, have neighbours and friends who do not believe in the great white throne. But whether they believe in it or not, the day is certainly coming when they are going to stand before the Lord Jesus enthroned in that great white throne. And it's going to be the most terrible and dreadful day. In fact, the fear and the awesomeness that will be attached to that day is something that we can wish on no one. It's something that the Lord Jesus himself can wish on no one. As certainly as the Bible is the word of God, it's coming. Every single person is going to see the great white throne. Every single person, believer and unbeliever. After the great white throne, there comes the results of the great white throne. The eternal burning lake of fire, which I'm going to talk about a bit tonight. It's so awful, so terrible, so horrific, it's almost beyond human comprehension as far as we are concerned. And that's why I want to say, first of all, that judgment has been kept for thousands of years because God loves this world so much. 
and he loves every single person in this world. <coughs> Judgment should have come thousands of years ago because we have deserved it. God in his grace has wanted to supply the remedy. He's wanted as many people as possible to take the great medicine that will stop the fear of the great white throne. There's only one remedy, and that's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. His sacrifice on the cross was so awful, because the doom that every <coughs> single person on this earth faced was so awful. He took one look at that doom, the lake of fire, and he knew that he had to provide a way out. And it was really important that that way was provided. Tonight, if you are in this meeting, or if you are listening to this tape, and you are without hope and without Christ, it's essential that you understand this great white throne is coming to you as well as to the rest of the world. Your reaction to the great white throne depends on whether you believe or whether you do not. If you believe, it holds no fear. If you do not believe, that day is coming and it's going to be frightening. Now there are some people, of course, who believe that death is going to provide a rest for them. Many people, and I was one of them, thought that at death there was curtains, there was nothing else. But that's a lie of Satan and it's deception. And if, you are, if any person listening here tonight is trusting in death as the, their final escape, they're in for a very bad shock indeed. For death is not the final. The day is coming when every unbeliever will stand in the majesty and the presence of God. And every unbeliever is going to feel as if they want to shrink up. They are going to long for everything to end. They just will ask for annihilation. They will not get it. Jesus suffered in such agony because of the awesomeness and the awfulness of what was coming. <laughs> Never, ever, ever underestimate what Jesus went through. He wouldn't have gone through all that if it hadn't been serious. And what we're talking about tonight is serious because it's real and because it's true. It's coming on the earth. It's coming soon. There is going to be a judgment. The great white throne. It's essential. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there may be people listening. It may be your last chance to believe on the Lord. You don't know what's going to happen. You could collapse and die as you leave this meeting. This is the most important moment of your life if you do not have Christ. You have got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The promise of the word of God is clear. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Know that he died for your sins and you will be saved from that judgment that's coming upon the earth. Make sure, make sure that tonight is the night if you do not believe yet on the Lord. He loves you. He does not want you before that throne. He does not want any member of the human race in the lake of fire. That's why he's provided such a wonderful salvation. To you who are Christians already, I pray that the reality of what we're talking about is going to be so great that you will be possessed by it. Because the very people you meet, as I've already said, are going to see the great white throne definitely. See it, they are going to. Definite, definite, definite. We have a job as watchmen to warn them what's coming upon them. Now we live in days where people do not like talking about hell, they do not like talking about judgment, and they do not like talking about the lake of fire. That's all deceit and it's all the enemy. If he can convince people that they don't exist, they will go fearless into the mouth of the abyss. We have got to make sure that we give them the message loud and clear. Scoffers, says Peter, will come in the last days. They're saying, oh, where's the promise of his coming? Go on, everyone said he's going to come. But come it's going to. That's the fact. 
Now, it would be wrong of me if I'm talking about the Great White Throne not to begin on a serious note like this. Salvation has been provided. It's as easy as believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. All right. Now we're ready to talk about this judgment that's coming, the Great White Throne. We're going to see what it is and when it's going to actually occur. But before we see that, let me just say something that is so obvious, very few people ever say it. Which is so obvious that very few people ever actually realise that they believe it. And that's this point, that every single person on the earth who's lived and died is going to be resurrected. Believer and unbeliever are going to be resurrected. Now I've said it, of course you believe it. Have you ever thought of it before? A resurrection is coming, which is going to affect not just the believers. Resurrection also is going to come to every unbeliever. Now what do I mean by resurrection? I do not mean resuscitation. So let's get that out of the way before we begin. Resuscitation is bringing someone back to life temporarily. Bringing them back to life so that in a few years' time they'll die instead of when their heart actually stopped beating. We have resuscitation in hospitals today. People whose hearts have stopped, they are resuscitated. That does not mean that they're not going to die. It means they've been brought back to life. Lazarus was brought back to life. He was resuscitated. But he's not still alive. Therefore he was not resurrected. Now that's definite. Resurrection is coming back to life forever and ever and ever. Never to die again. And every person on the face of this earth who has lived and died is going to be resurrected. Not resuscitated. They are going to live Forever. Yes. Believers in heaven, unbelievers in the lake of fire. And it is the fact of resurrection that makes our salvation so wonderful and their doom so awful. Forever and ever. I'll repeat that again. Resuscitation is temporarily bringing someone back to life. Resurrection is bringing them back to life so that they'll never die again. And every person, believer and unbeliever, is going to be resurrected. Both. There's a difference. Let's see a passage in the Old Testament, and then a passage that Jesus actually spoke, that uh, tells us that. Daniel chapter 12, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, just read it. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. This is just to show you that actually the message has been around for thousands of years. This is not something new that came with Christ. <coughs> Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Verse 1 is talking about the tribulation, a time of trouble that's coming. 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, their believers, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. There it is. There is going to be a resurrection, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt and shame. There are the two resurrections. But resurrections they are, both of them. Let's have a look at the, the other. This is Jesus talking now uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 5. The Gospel of John and chapter 5. This, if you remember, is the passage that I actually went through at the beginning of the course. Number one, when I was talking about Jesus as the mediator and about grace before judgment. John chapter 5, and I'm going to read it to refresh your memories but not go through it again. Beginning verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son. I went into that in some detail, I think. And showed him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, 
even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. And the first Bible study dealt with the fact that Jesus was the judge. That all men should honour the Son, even as they honour the Father. He that honoureth not the Son, honoureth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth him that sent me, hath everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. That's a promise for you believers. You will not come into judgment. The great white throne is not for you. You will see it, but you will not be judged by it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, all. Every person who has died will hear his voice and shall come forth. That's resurrection. They are all going to come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. And the good, by the way, is defined in John 3. If you'll keep your finger in this passage and turn to John chapter 3, verse 18, verse 18 and 19 and 20, actually. All right? So verse 18, beginning at. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither come to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light. And what it's saying is that the regenerate, the born again, are ones who have done good. They have come to the light and they have received of the light. The ones who are not born again have done evil and they have not wanted the light. Right, so verse 29 of John 5 again. That and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. There it is. Now there are the two resurrections. Both are resurrections and both, both last forever. One's eternal life, the other is eternity in the lake of fire. The difference is that they occur at different times. Alright? The believers are resurrected at least 1,000 years before the unbelievers are resurrected. At least 1,000 years difference between them. The believers, by the beginning of the millennium, are all resurrected. I'm going into this in detail. Are all resurrected by the beginning of the millennium. The unbelievers are not resurrected until the end of the millennium. Now there's the thousand years. By this point, the second advent, all the believers in the past who have died have been resurrected. The unbelievers are not resurrected to the end of the millennium. All right? Now to see that, let's turn to the passage that deals with it in some detail. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to begin verse 20. Oh, this is glorious. Perhaps you've never understood what it means about death being conquered. Perhaps tonight you're going to understand it for the first time. It's a glorious passage, this. One of my favourites. Verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead. And now, today, he is risen from the dead. Yesterday, he was risen from the dead. Tomorrow, he's going to be risen from the dead. He rose once with results that last forever. Having risen, he's risen forever. That's what the Greek says. So there's never a day in your life, in the future, where Christ will not be risen. May that be a great source of comfort to us all. He's risen from the dead. And become the first fruits of them that slept. Slept there means those who have died. Those who had died in the past, right from Adam onwards, they're, they're in the claws of death. Christ too was in the claws of death, 
but he's risen from the dead. He's the first fruits. And I've said before in my ministry that the first fruits were given as a sign that the rest would come up too. The first fruits was part of the harvest lifted up to God. There it is. But as surely as the first fruits have been risen, so are the rest going to be risen. That's the point. So he's the first fruits. Now here we go. For since by man came death, by man came also resurrection of the dead. And that dead is unbelievers and believers. Both. By Adam came death. You will die physically because of Adam's sin. We've seen that before in the first series. By Christ came resurrection of the dead. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. And all means all. That does not mean that all shall be saved. Verse 21 shows what it means. It's talking about resurrection. Unbelievers and believers die because of Adam. So unbelievers and believers are going to be resurrected because of Christ. Alright? Now there's the point. This, by the way, this verse, as you probably know, is used by a lot of people to suggest that everyone is saved. Actually, again, the context is verse 21. It's talking about resurrection. All shall be made alive, unbeliever and believer. But every man in his own order. They're not all going to be resurrected together. They're going to be resurrected in their own order. And that word order there is a military term for a company in an army. Now, an army has battalions, and each battalion has four companies. So what this is saying is every man is going to be raised in his own company. The battalion of human beings are going to be raised in four companies. I'm going to call them A company, B company, C company, and D company just to be as if we're in the army. Okay, A company, B company, C company, and D company. And let's see who's in each one, because this is very important. Well, the first one is in verse 23. Christ, the first fruits. A company's only got one person in it, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Three days after he died, he rose from the dead, the first fruits. Right, so A company's already received resurrection. All the other resurrections are to come. Next it says, Afterward they that are Christ at his coming. And these are believers, and they're in two companies. B company and C company. Right? These are believers only. At the rapture, B company is raised. Who's B company? It's all the church members who have died. You remember what happens. The Lord Jesus comes back for his bride. We saw that last time. First, the dead in Christ rise. So if you've had brothers and sisters or members of your family who've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they've died, they're going to be resurrected before you are. It's only going to be a little time before you and we put them all in B company, actually. They're going to be raised and they'll be with Christ in the clouds. Then we who are alive will be taken up to be with them. Those of us believers who are alive at the rapture will not die physically. We should be changed. He actually says later on in this chapter, not all shall die, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. Those who died in Christ will be resurrected. Then we will be changed to be with them. Now that's B company. That's a wonderful resurrection. Okay? Who's C company? Well, these are also believers. And here they are, at the end of the tribulation, all the Old Testament saints... The two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11 and all the people who've died as believers in the tribulation, they're all going to be raised. That's seven years after us. So they're only seven years behind us. They're all going to be raised up. And that C company, how wonderful. I'm going to say that again. C company are all the Old Testament saints. Here's Rahab coming. Here's Ezekiel. Here's Jeremiah, Daniel, Adam, Moses, Abraham. They're all coming up. Sorry, I've said Moses. Not Moses, I'll talk about him. All the Old Testament saints, the two witnesses who are Moses and Elijah of Revelation 11, who witness to the Jews in Jerusalem, 
they'll be raised up too. So will all the people who've been martyred during the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, C Company will be resurrected. Now there all the believers up. That's what I meant by the fact that at the beginning of the millennium, all the believers who have died will be resurrected. They're all up now. Those who are still alive at the second advent, they go through, as you know, and people the earth in the millennium, and they will not die. At the end of the millennium, they'll be changed just like the church, who were still alive at Christ's rapture, will be changed. Okay? So you've got A company, Christ. B company, the dead in Christ. The church who, the members of the church who had died before the rapture. C company, Old Testament saints, Moses and Elijah, and all the tribulational martyrs. They're raised. So but by the time we get to the second advent, all the believers are up. And the Bible defines that as the first resurrection. In the first group, all the believers are up. That's what Daniel was talking about. That's what Jesus was talking about. All right, well, we've only got D Company to come. Who's D Company? D Company are all the unbelievers who have died in the Old Testament at the time of Christ, during the church period, during the tribulation. They're all kept in death <coughs> until the end of the millennium when they will be raised. Theirs is not raising to everlasting life. This is a resurrection to judgment. And so D Company comes up 1,000 years after C Company. And that's the complete resurrection. Alright? Now there it is. Uh, verse 24 gives D Company. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. And you remember at the end of the millennium, there's a revolt against God. And the Lord Jesus smites them down. And he presents the kingdom, which is then fully his, with Satan gone, with all the unbelievers actually resurrected and gone out of the way. He presents the kingdom to God. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Verse 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death is not destroyed until the last resurrection. Let's take this in a bit more detail. This is marvellous. Because most people interpret this verse as just meaning that from that time, death won't have any influence. But it doesn't mean that. What it means is that any influence or any effect that death has ever had since the earth was established is reversed, repealed and annulled. There is not one person by the end of the millennium who is still captured in death. Death at the moment has got hundreds of victims. And it's getting more every day. Death is gathering them in. A company, B company, C company, and at the end of the millennium, D company means that every single one of death's victims have been removed from his grip. Praise his wonderful name. That's why the last enemy is death. Death thought it had won. Death thought it had got these people. And when Christ got out of death, it realized, hold on, I'm beginning to lose my grip. And when the church dead rise, hold on, I'm losing the battle. And at the second advent, I'm losing the battle. And finally, the end of the millennium, there will not, one be, per there will not be one person who is dead. Every single person will have been resurrected. Death will have not one conquered person in its grip. The Lord Jesus will be complete victor over death. There will not be one person that death can say, I still own this one. Because the Lord has provided resurrection. And that's what it means. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Hallelujah. Praise God. No, it's not destroyed now. No, and it will not be destroyed until the end of the millennium. You imagine it. Death's going to be empty. That's why this point about resurrection for unbelievers is so important. Because if unbelievers are still dead, then death still won. It's still got some people. No. In Christ, all shall be resurrected. All are going to come back to life. Oh, praise his wonderful name. Oh, death, where's your sting? You haven't got any sting left. Yes, that's right. You're finished. You're losing your grip. You weren't as strong as you were. You're losing your hold. Now, that's a verse... But it's so rarely exegeted, so rarely explained, but it's glorious. 
But you see now why it comes after the fact that every man shall be raised in his own order. Praise God, that's a revelation. But the point is, unbelievers are going to be resurrected, never to die again. Here's the frightening thing. I'm going to read that again, verse 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. The Father will never be under the authority of the Son. Uh, isn't that glorious? The Son has done it all, but still he's given it all to the Father. No credit for himself, no glory for himself, occupied only with the glory he can give his Father. Oh, may we be like that. Our Father's glory, first of all. Okay, let's see this in a bit more detail. Would you turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> all right, now, uh, you remember from chapter 6 through to chapter 18, it has described the horrors of the tribulation. In chapter 19, we saw the second advent and the victory that came with the second advent. Now, what do we see? We then see the beginning of the millennium. And this is chapter 20, the beginning of the millennium. And I saw, says John, an angel, come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit is the abyss. And it's the place where the devil's going to be locked up for a thousand years. It's the devil's jail, and it's strong enough to hold him, too. And notice a great chain in his hand that's to bind him so that he can't have any influence. During the millennium, the devil is locked up. Now, if you want to know more details about this, I suggest that you make sure you come to the series of Bible studies on prophecy, which will be given in some detail. Satan then, at the beginning of the millennium, is chained up. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent. Old why? Because he's been around a long time. But his days are numbered, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. There it is, that's the millennium. Millennium means one thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit, or the abyss, and shut him up. A lid was put on, so that no one could hear his cries either. That's going to happen. And by the way, if the rapture occurs next year, this is going to occur seven years after that. So we're talking about something that may be eight years' time, or twenty years' time, or whatever time it is. It's soon. No wonder Satan is getting anxious. He knows what's going to happen. He's going to be thrown into a pit, chained up, and a tight lid shut on him. And for one thousand years he's going to spend it all by himself in solitary confinement. Shut up. He's not going to use the earth anymore as his plaything. Praise God for it. And shut him up. And set a seal upon him. Now that was the seal they used to put a seal on to make sure that no one had got out. And every day that seal will be checked. To check that Satan's still in there. And of course he will be. Praise God. You've got a seal upon you, you know. Hallelujah. And it means that you're locked up for eternity under God. Praise his wonderful name. That he should deceive the nations no more. That means that he is now deceiving the nations. And they are deceived. They are. The day may come when the nations forbid us talking about hell, talking about judgment, because they say it's psychologically bad for people in our society. They are deceived because the very people who pass the laws will them, are themselves being deceived and will themselves end up, first of all in hell, then before the great white throne, and then in the lake of fire. Deceive the nations, no more, till the thousand years shall be fulfilled. At the end of the thousand years, it says... He must be loosed a little season. For a short while, at the end of the millennium, Satan's going to be let out. I'm not even going to tell you why, so that that makes sure that you will come to my talks on prophecy, <laughs> when all will be revealed. Right, so we're dealing then with the locking up of Satan at the beginning of the millennium. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, 
neither his image, neither have received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ 1,000 years. Now, who are these? These are the tribulational martyrs. They're raised at the beginning of the millennium and they reign with Christ for 1,000 years. Praise God. They have not received the mark of the beast, which is a religious organization seal that will be given out in the tribulation. They haven't received it. They have stuck closely to the Lord and they've been martyred and tortured terribly during that time. But now they're reigning with Christ. They reign for a thousand years. There it is. Now in verse 5, could you put open brackets before the but? Open brackets, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished and close brackets there. This is the first resurrection. Now, the bit in brackets in verse 5 describes what happened to the rest of the dead. Now, let's get it. Verse 4 is actually the first resurrection. Verse 4 is the first resurrection. And the end part of verse 5 applies to verse 4, as is obvious as we read on. The first resurrection is the resurrection of believers. The second resurrection is the resurrection of unbelievers. And just for completeness sake... The writer has put here what's going to happen to the rest of the dead. All the people who are not believers uh, live not again, will not be resurrected again until the thousand years were finished. But the first resurrection, and let's get a definition, is the resurrection of all believers before the millennium. That is the first resurrection. Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Amen. These are believers. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death hath no power. We'll see the definition of it. I'll give it to you now. The second death is the name given to eternal judgment in the lake of fire. The second death is not physical death. That's the first death. The second death is... Eternity spent in the lake of fire. Alright? So, let's read it again. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. They're believers. On such the second death hath no power. If you are a believer, you will not be thrown into the lake of fire. The word of God says it. And that cannot be broken. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the second death has no effect upon you. Praise God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. That's what this verse is saying. It's the gospel message in the book of Revelation. Believe, believe, believe. What does it cost you but your pride to believe in the Lord Jesus? Only your pride. That's all. Believe, and on you, the second death hath no power. The converse is true. If you do not believe, the second death is for you. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Hallelujah. That's right. Okay, verse 7. Now, I'm not going through this in much detail. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Now, we've jumped now 1,000 years to the end of the millennium. Shall be loosed out of his prison. He shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, they're the believers, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. I'm not going to deal with that tonight. Verse 10. And here, you remember when we dealt with the judgment of Satan, we dealt with the three falls. Here is the scripture which describes the third fall of Satan. His final judgment, when he is finally thrown into the lake of fire. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. At the end of the millennium, the devil is let out for a time. Once he's deceived the nations, he is then thrown into the lake of fire for eternity. <coughs> into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Ever and ever. There is no escape. Resurrection is permanent. 
and the unbeliever will be with the devil in the lake of fire, tormented day and night for ever and ever. Now I know it offends our human minds. The Bible is a greater authority than our human minds and may we recognize that. In fact, we can get nowhere tonight unless we take the fact that the Bible is the inspired word of God. If it says it, it means it. And we are not to question as far as that's concerned. I said it passes all human comprehension. We cannot understand it but it's real. The beast and the false prophet have actually been in there for 1,000 years. They were cast in in Revelation chapter 20, sorry, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. All right, they've been in 1,000 years already. That's the third fall of Satan. Now here's the great white throne. Here it is. It's real. It's not fantasy. It's not a story. It's real. It's going to be like this. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was no pla place found for them. At the end of the millennium, the earth and heaven, the whole universe, will be destroyed. From what we read, it looks as if there will be a nuclear fission process, which will add to the lake of fire. They will just melt away. Isaiah describes them as a scroll that rolls up. He can't describe it in any other way. But if you've seen an H-bomb go up, that's what the cloud looks like. An explosion, and it seems as if the cloud then rolls up into itself. And if you read Isaiah, that's almost exactly what he's talking about. And when the earth and the universe are destroyed, they're added to the lake of fire. This is a nuclear inferno that is going on. And that's Jesus revealed as he truly is in power and glory. When he comes at the end of the millennium in the power and glory which is fully his, the earth and the universe have to disappear into a flash of smoke. That's how powerful he is. Yes, and he's on your side. Praise God. <laughs> how wonderful. That's right. Heaven and earth flee away, there's no place found for them. Why? Because he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Well, if they have to flee away from where he is, there's no place for them. So they vanish. They have to be added to the lake of fire. There's nowhere else. No place for them at all. And now we have the resurrection of D Company, the resurrection of unbelievers. And I saw the dead, small and great. I think, feel that's tragic, you know, that it's put that way. Because if it was put great and small, you'd, you'd immediately say, it doesn't matter how big you are, whether you're a king, you're a counselor, it just doesn't matter. You're going to stand there. But the small come first. And some people think, because they're small, they don't do any harm to anyone. They just live their own quiet life. They don't affect anyone. They're going to be all right. And they're deceived. For living a quiet life doesn't make you all right. I've heard it said that... Um, Perfect love's not the only thing that casts out fear. It's ignorance and apathy that does as well. And these people are ignorant. They think just because they live in their little bed sit and don't harm anyone else, they're all right. They're not. There's only salvation in one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether you live in a palace or a bed sit, whether you are the noisiest person or the most introverted person, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. You need his salvation. You need his grace. The small and great stood before God. Death is finished at this point. Death is vanquished at this point and destroyed. They stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And I believe this, that their sins were taken on the cross. We've seen that before under atonement. That Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. The books contain everything they've ever done in their lives. And I believe that when God looks through these books, he's trying to find something that will mean that they can be saved. He's trying to find something that they've done that's so good that it matches what Christ did. But he won't find anything. And it's at this time that we'll hear them saying as well, Lord, Lord, I've done this. But Lord, I've done that. But Lord, I've done this. And God will say, I know, I can read it here. But I'm afraid it's not good enough. You mean to say that you thought that would actually get you to heaven? 
It's not true. It's not good enough, I'm afraid. And notice, the book of life is open too. The book of life at this time is a register of all those who've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's almost as if God, in grace, doubly checks up. And he looks at the book of life, and their name isn't there. And it's no good. It's no good. Can you imagine the feelings that will go through their hearts? Can you imagine what is actually going to go through their minds at this point? It's hopeless. But, Lord, I've done all those good works. And he'll say, look, all your good works are as filthy rags before me. The more good works you've got, the bigger pile of filthy rags you've got. And it's useless as far as I'm concerned. Why didn't you believe? But I never had the opportunity. Oh, yes, you did. Don't you remember that brother who told you about the Lord and you thought he was a religious fanatic and crank? And you thought, oh, go on, that's old-fashioned medieval nonsense. You, the Lord will say, you have turned down the remedy. And I'm afraid that's judgment. Notice what it says, verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Those who died on land and at sea, it means that there's nowhere that you can escape this judgment. No matter where you died, you are going to be resurrected. He knows. Every bone and every skull that is found on this earth belongs to someone who one day is going to be resurrected. Either in the first resurrection or at the end of the millennium. And that's the fact of the matter. We call this earth actually the land of the living. It's actually the greatest cemetery in the universe, isn't it? Yes? Millions, thousands of millions of people are buried on the very earth that we live on. And they're still here. Their remains are still there and the Lord knows each one of them. And they're going to be resurrected. Tragically, for most of them. There it is. It doesn't matter where you die or where you go. The judgment is going to catch up. That's why the grace of God will also catch up. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. And notice what it says. And death and hell were delivered up. Sorry, say that again. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. That's complete resurrection from, from the dead, from hell. And the dead, sorry, and the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. The Lord looks at their works and he says, it's no good. There's nothing good enough to save you. If you've been trusting on those, I'm sorry for you. It's no good. Verse 14 is a very interesting verse. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Some people say to unbelievers, you're going to spend eternity in hell. You will not. You will not. Hell is a temporary stopping place for the dead, unregenerate. Alright? It's a temporary stopping place. At the millennium, at the end of the millennium, when the dead unbelievers are raised, hell's going to be cast into the lake of fire. And death is. Why? Because they're empty. They're finished. Death's got no one in it. Hell's got no one in it. So they're thrown into the lake of fire as well. And he says, this is the second death. And you remember I defined that. To be thrown into the lake of fire is the second death. Upon those who take part in the first resurrection, it has no effect. If you're a believer, you'll be up in the first resurrection. Fear not. Okay. And here's the tragic verse the most tragic of them all. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, that is all the unregenerate, all the unbelievers, was cast into the lake of fire. And that's the final judgment. That is the judgment which results from the great white throne. The casting into the lake of fire which is coming. Um, as I began tw 26 Bible studies ago on if, I might as well tell you that actually verse 15 doesn't read and whosoever was not found written in the book of life. It's actually an if there. It actually says, and if any was not found written in the book of life, they were cast into the lake of fire. I'll say that again. And if any was not found written in the book of life, was, they were cast into the lake of fire. And the if there is first class condition. If and I'm afraid it's true. Not any of them were found written in the book of life. Even the if there confirms these are all unregenerate. D company consists entirely of unbelievers. There are no believers involved in this at all.
Okay? So that's it. Absolutely no un um, believers at this point. This is all unbelievers. Now there is the passage that deals with the great white throne. Alright? I want to say this uh, by way of ending. Many have said that hell and the theory of eternal judgment and the lake of fire are actually the product of Paul's warped mind. I want to say this about that. Paul actually had very little indeed to say about hell, or about judgment, or about the lake of fire. The person who spoke about it more than anyone else was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he was the one that reiterated time and time again, it is not just judgment, it is eternal judgment. He said time and time again, there is gnashing of teeth, there is wailing, there is everlasting fire. The Lord Jesus is the only one whose word we can accept and trust on this. He's the one who's seen the full horror of it. He's the only one. If ever anyone says to you, that is just Pauline doctrine, point out to them, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said more about these things than anyone else. That's how big an issue it really is. The lake of fire was not designed for people. God did not want any person at all in the lake of fire. Let's see some scriptures that, one scripture actually that tells us that. We've seen it before. In 1 Timothy, chapter 4. In 1 Timothy, chapter 4, and verse 10. One Timothy four and verse ten. For therefore we both labour and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Saviour of all men, especially those who believe. He died for everyone. All you've got to do is believe. It also says, Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Two Peter two says that. He wants all men saved. Uh, in Matthew 25 and verse 41 it says, The lake of fire which was designed, which was made for the devil and his angels. It was not designed for the human race. God has given the remedy. If you choose to ignore the remedy, then it is on your own head. The remedy is simple. The remedy is easy. The tragedy of all tragedies is that when the devil goes to the lake of fire, he's going to drag many people in the human race with him. The Bible defines that we belong to two families on this earth. The family of God or the family of the devil. He said to the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. And if the devil is cast into the lake of fire, if the father is, so will every unbeliever who belongs to his family. I'm afraid it's reality. It's urgent. It's important. It's going to affect our neighbours, our friends. That's the message. The final, the most awful and terrible judgment is the judgment of the great white throne. The alternative is everlasting life in heaven. The alternative is forever and ever with the Lord. Hallelujah. And it hasn't been cancelled either. It's still going. Praise God. Let's repeat it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. I'm just going to end by reading John chapter 3. Two passages from it. You'll forgive me for my repetition. It's urgent. I feel the urgency. John chapter 3. Two passages. Verse 16 to 18, first of all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to judge the world. It was not his intention, but that the world through him 
might be saved. He that believeth on him is not judged. But he that believeth not is judged already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You may feel secure now if you have not believed the wrath of God is upon you now. And it's nothing compared to what is, is ahead. May we as Christians, may we as the Lord's servants, may we as the beloved of the Lord, decide that this world is not for us, it's perishing, it's dying, and may we give ourselves wholly to the Lord, entirely to the Lord. We have a message to give out, and it's an important one. It needs dedication. It needs 100%, not 99. 100%. May we ask every day for the Lord to fill us with power, with His Holy Spirit, that we may be effective witnesses for Him to a world that's in need, that is lost, and that is going to a lost eternity. May God bless you all. Amen.